coming. We very much appreciate it. I'd like to give particular thanks to Ms. Emily Stevenson, Perrin, who will be speaking to, and Dr. Ed Ellinger, who I'll be introducing shortly in their participation of our celebration today of, and this week of National Infant Immunization Week. Um, it's particularly important, I think, at this time to, uh, to celebrate uh, the tremendous success of infant immunization, uh, something that we enjoy every day but rarely stop to consider what our benefits are. Before we had infant vaccines, uh, millions of infants suffered every year. In fact, before we had a vaccine against uh, smallpox back in the 1920s, we had 100,000 cases a year in the United States. Uh, before we had the diphtheria vaccine in the 1930s, we had 200,000 cases of diphtheria every year, and nearly that number of cases of pertussis or whooping cough. Now, interestingly, back then we didn't have the means to do a great diagnosis and we missed it all the time in adolescents and adults. In fact, pertussis or whooping cough was only diagnosed in infants and it was a real killer of infants and we had about 200,000 cases and uh, close to 10,000 deaths every year from whooping cough. Similarly, the next decade brought uh, vaccines against uh, polio and before we had a vaccine polio, we had 30,000 in cases of polio year, mainly spread by infants and mainly suffered by older people, uh, school age and teenagers and adults. Uh, in the 1960s, we suffered routinely every year 500,000 cases of measles uh, with its attendant hospitalizations and deaths. And in that same decade, 200,000 or so cases of mumps every year. Um, but again before the vaccine. The 1970s we were uh, suffering nearly 50,000 cases of rubella which resulted in congenital rubella syndrome and the birth defects. Again, uh, a com nearly eliminated by our vaccines against m measles, mumps, and rubella. And then finally during the decade that I trained as a physician we were suffering 20,000 cases of Haemophilus influenza type B vaccine nearly eliminated again through the Hib vaccine. Um, infant vaccinations have done an incredible job reducing the rates of these diseases to less than 1% of what we were suffering before we had the vaccines. But we can't rest on our laurels. Um, 12,000 babies are born every day in the United States and by the time they reach two they need to have received about 24 injections and three doses of vaccines. That's a lot of work to be done for every baby uh, for, uh, in the coming future. Um, the suppression of these diseases, however, has resulted in a fair amount of complacency and recklessness. Uh, we forget what we enjoy as a benefit and start giving credence to uh, a sense that maybe we should put it off, spread out the vaccines, maybe it's just too many shots, too many needles. Um, and we see parents and other groups seeking uh, exemptions from school and daycare requirements for the vaccines. As we saw in the Super Bowl this year in Indianapolis, however, these vaccine preventable diseases that seem to be a thing of a past are just a plane ride away. Uh, at the Super Bowl, we ended up suffering about 14 cases of measles, mainly affecting families who had chosen not to get vaccinated against the measles disease. Here in Rochester last week, we had four cases of pertussis or whooping cough disease we thought we had eliminated with uh, infant vaccination against pertussis. Well, it used to kill 10,000 babies a year in the United States and we haven't had a death uh, it, this year from pertussis yeah, among our infants. And, uh, these days we have better means of diagnosing uh, the disease, but we're still dependent on our vaccinations to prevent the cases. Now, I diagnosed one of these children myself. It was a 13-year-old um, who had had a cough for two weeks. 13-year-old old enough to be babysitting infants. Fortunately, she hadn't. She did go to school every day for the two weeks while she was contagious, however, and her classmates are taking antibiotics, hopefully to prevent their developing of the disease. Um, I have seen pertussis kill babies. I saw a four-week-old die uh, in ICU when I served as a third-year resident. Um, I've transported twins who suffered from pertussis lived but spent much of their first year in the hospital in and out of the ICU struggling with shortness of breath and uh, difficulty with uh, breathing. 
we can't delay these vaccines. Infants need protection against pertussis from birth, but the earliest we can vaccinate them is six weeks at li of life, and then they're only immune after three doses. By the time they're six months of age, we can say they're protected. So the only way we can really protect them is by uh, broad uh, vaccination and uh, efforts made with all of our children to create a cocoon around them. In fact, we have now started vac vaccinating adolescents and adults against pertussis to help support and create that halo or cocoon, if you will, around our infants. As for safety, across all our drugs, all our therapeutics, all our surgical interventions, vaccines represent the safest things that we doctors and nurses have to prevent disease and to treat disease. We have safety records in the millions of experiences, whereas with most of our drugs, we don't have anything close to that kind of safety record or that kind of data. The vaccines represent our greatest public health achievement, and yet their success in some ways has become their own worst enemy because it makes us forgetful and thoughtless. The snake oil salesmen and charlatans can uh, invent lies about their associations with autism and other concerns, and celebrities who don't know any better fall prey, and suddenly suggestibility turns to anxiety and fear and terrible mistakes. So it's good to look back on what we've accomplished and it's good to see where we've been and get our bearings again. Let us celebrate this week, this National Infant Immunization Week, and think about all the good that we have done and received because of infant vaccination. And let us work to uphold these successes and protect our loved ones by continuing to vaccinate against the horrors of infant vaccine-preventable diseases. Now, I'd like to introduce to you Minnesota's physician, Dr. Ed Ellinger, who is, who is the Minnesota Commissioner of Health since appointed by Governor Dayton in January of 2011. Um, in that role, he's responsible for leading the, um, uh, that department's mission to protect, maintain, and improve the health of all Minnesotans. Uh, before coming to MDH, many of you might have even known him as the Director and Chief Health Officer at Boynton Health Service at the University of Minnesota. Um, you know, from 1995 to 2011, he served in that role. He's also served as an adjunct professor in the uh, Division of Epidemiology and Community Health at the U's Public, uh, School of Public Health. And from 1980 to 1995, he served as a director for personal health services for the Min Minneapolis Health Department. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Ellinger. Thank you, Dr. Jacobson, and what a great place to come to talk about um, infant immunizations here in, in Rochester, where you're doing an excellent job, great partnerships. And I come with greetings from uh, Governor Dayton. Uh, and as part of Governor Dayton's uh, push to make Minnesota the best state in the union, he recognizes that health is really important to what we're trying to do. And it re harkens back to a quotation I often use from the physician to Alexander the Great, the Herophilus of Chalcedon from 2,500 years ago, and he said, when health is absent, wisdom can't reveal itself, art cannot become manifest, strength cannot fight, wealth becomes useless, and intelligence cannot be applied. Everything that we do in this state really depends on the health of the people in this state. Everything, the economics, the education, the business, the art, the <clears throat> you know, intelligence, the creativity. And as you look at things that have really impacted the health, immunizations are number one. On the, ten, the list of the 10 most influential public health interventions of the last 100 years, immunizations is right up there at the top. And we've increased life expectancy by 30 years over the last 100 years. And many of that, those years were created by immunizations. So with that in mind, we're here to really reflect on uh, what we're going to be doing now and in the future. And then Dr. Jacobson certainly listed all of the reasons why, from the medical standpoint, the health reasons, but there are other reasons. Uh, you know, mentioned that it keeps everybody healthy, but it also has eliminated fear. I mean, I'm of the generation, and, and Governor Dayton, the same age as I, we remember when polio was closing down schools, when we couldn't go to swimming pools, when we had friends and neighbors who died or were maimed by a disease that really we haven't seen in this country for a long time. It eliminates that fear. And it protects everyone. That's one of the public health messages. It protects everyone, not just those who get immunized, but those, if we have a good uh, supply of vaccine to among the population, those who can't get immunized because they're too young or have some immune deficiencies, it protects them. So it helps everybody. We're in this together. It helps children stay in daycare. It helps 
students stay in school. It helps p parents stay at work. It really helps the economic engine of this state. Uh, and certainly, it reduced costs. I mean, it is one of the most cost beneficial uh, interventions that we have. The dollars that are saved from vaccines are innumerable in a cost, health costs, but also in productivity costs and education costs. Um, so, and uh, the other thing that I think immunizations really reflect, it reflects the partnerships that we have in the state. And this is one of the things that I really celebrate when we talk about Im uh, immunizations, in particular infant immunizations, is the partnerships that we have, you know, with the mayor, with the Minnesota uh, Academy of Family Practice, uh, with the Minnesota Medical Association, with the um, Minnesota chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, with local public health, uh, with CDC, our, our federal partners, with clinics throughout the state, with providers throughout the state. This is what's really important is the, per the partnerships that we have. That's what got us to this point and that's what's going to keep us leading the nation in, in immunizations. So with that I have a little proclamation and I've gone through all of the whereas's, why we're really doing this and therefore I, with speaking in Mark Dayton's voice, Mark Dayton, Governor of the Minnesota, do hereby proclaim the week of April 21 through 28, 2012 as Infant Immunization Awareness Week. Signed by Mark Dayton and Secretary of State Mark Ritchie. And it really does reflect the fact that we think immunizations are one of the most important things that we can do in the state for children, for their families, for education, for business, for the entire state. So thanks for having me be part of the celebration. And now I get to really introduce some, some of the really reasons why we're here, the kids and the parents. And um, I get to do Emily Stevenson. Uh, one of the parents who will share one of her stories. Uh, she's the mother of a baby girl who suffered from a vaccine preventable disease before she was old enough to be vaccinated and she will share her family's experience and uh, the message to other parents. Welcome. Um, I am the mother of a beautiful baby girl who's now seven months old. Um, when she was five weeks old, we noticed that something was wrong. It started with a fever and a mild cough. We brought her into the doctor and they explained that her symptoms could mean a lot of different things. The worst, absolute worst case um, being pertussis or whooping cough. My heart sank at that moment as I remembered receiving a notice just the week before from our older daughter's classroom that a case of pertussis had been reported. Um, our baby was too young at the time, at five weeks old, to receive the DTaP vaccine. And even though everyone in our family had been vaccinated, including both my husband and I had gotten the adult booster, um, she still got sick. Um, pertussis is highly contagious and we do believe that she caught this disease from the child in our older daughter's classroom just by accident and by a fluke. Um, her symptoms quickly worsened over the next few days. She was having frequent coughing attacks to the point where she wasn't able to eat or sleep, some pretty basic functions for a five week old. Um, our scariest moment at home was when she stopped breathing while sitting in her infant seat. Um, she recovered from this episode, um, but at that point we knew we were dealing with something really scary and really serious. Um, this time our doctor confirmed that our baby did in fact have pertussis. Um, she was hospitalized right away, and as her coughing spells became more intense and more worrisome, she was moved into the intensive care unit. Um, during this time, there was very little that the doctors could do for her as she weathered through the peak phase of the illness. Um, she received excellent medical care and um, we knew we were in the best of hands, but it was the scariest situation we could have ever imagined, truthfully. Um, pertussis causes intense coughing spells along with other respiratory complications and is particularly dangerous for infants because of their really immature respiratory systems. Um, our baby had a lot of trouble clearing the thick mucus away um, in her airway and she was felt like she was continuously deprived of oxygen during this time. Um, the illness also placed considerable stress on her small heart as the pressure would build in her chest when she was too small to, to relieve that pressure by coughing. So it, it, was, it was really difficult. Um, unfortunately, these symptoms and consequences are very typical for an infant with pertussis. The weeks we spent in the hospital were very difficult. Um, we had to watch our baby fight very hard against a respiratory illness that her body was just not ready to handle. Um, every day we watched her struggle for breath, unable to eat or sleep, and have to linger in pain. We are thankful for her very strong will, um, which she still has, 
and for the good medical care that she received. Um, after about four weeks in the ICU, her symptoms began to wane a little bit, indicating that she had very thankfully made it past the peak phase of pertussis. Um, and a few weeks later, then we were able to go home. We've been home now for about four months, and she still has the occasional coughing spell, a couple a day. Um, but we are grateful for every day that she shows improvement. We know she's gonna be okay. Um, we also know how unbelievably fortunate that we are to have made it through this ordeal, having such a small baby have to go through this. We also know that there are many families out there th who have not been as fortunate as we have. The reality is that pertussis can be largely prevented by the DTaP vaccine. Um, and very truthfully, before this experience, I'd always viewed the vaccine debate as a, just an individual, personal choice. I gave a lot of respect to people who made their own choices, and I, I didn't you know, get involved in the debate in any way. Um, we chose to have our children vaccinated, but I didn't really have a really strong opinions about the other choices that parents made. Um, we have now witnessed the very harsh reality of what can and will happen when parents refuse to have their children vaccinated against these diseases. Their choices do not only impact the health of their own families, but the health of the entire community, especially where infants who are too young to have received the vaccine or other um, vulnerable children are concerned. We've also learned that the incidence rate of pertussis in Minnesota has grown considerably over the past few years, and that can largely be attributed to more parents choosing not to vaccine. Um, we are hopeful that for the safety of individual families and for the community, that more parents will listen to the advice given by medical professionals and choose to have their children vaccinated against these preventable diseases. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Stevenson, for sharing that with us. I know that must have been very difficult to share, but it means a lot for us to hear that, and it's a very compelling lesson for us to remember and to learn, particularly during this week when we celebrate National Infant Immunization Week, to understand that our job isn't done. It continues every day. I'd also like to thank Dr. Ellinger for his words, as well as for sharing Dr. Uh, Governor Dayton's uh, commitment through his proclamation for this week. Now I'd like to open it up for questions. I would just ask, um, what is the number one obstacle that you guys face right now as far as um, getting parents to um, vaccinate their children? Is it, you know, a lack of education or, you know, cultural thing or what is it? I, you know, I, I used to say it's a, a, it, there were combinations of issues of access and finance, but here in Minnesota through the Vaccines for Children program, um, we actually have a way of making sure that families who can't afford the vaccine can get the vaccine without having to leave their uh, pediatrician or family physician's office. I used to say it was uh, we didn't have vaccines for some of these diseases and we had shortages, but actually uh, through a lot of work done with uh, uh, the government, with uh, states and with manufacturers, we have um, most of the time frequent access uh, so that we can vaccinate. I used to say it was uh, physicians didn't understand when vaccines should be given or given, uh, not given. In fact, um, we used to, when I was in training, think of the well child visit as the only time to vaccinate. Now we use every visit to review when the child is vaccinated, if they're needing vaccines, they might have come in for an ear infection, a follow up on asthma, we vaccinate. I used to think it was physicians who didn't, um, who really misunderstood the rules for when you don't vaccinate and invented contraindications, it seemed, as to why they shouldn't be giving a vaccine. But I think physicians and nurses now have a much better understanding. Um, now I think much of it is hesitancy from anxieties and fears, a sense that um, this is too much, this is, uh, this is not natural. Um, in fact, I think it's driven by uh, sort of a 
frankly, the success of the vaccine making these disappear is not everyday talk and everyday concern. If I go um, every day without diphtheria, I'm not writing a letter to the Post Bulletin or up to Governor Dayton saying, thank you for another day without diphtheria. I just go complacently along, not recognizing that I've enjoyed that benefit. Um, I think it's that complacency that, and then allowing that sort of hesitancy. In some ways, we live in a, a zero risk society where we think nothing should ever hurt, nothing should ever um, uh, uh, cause any possible risk of maybe even an allergic reaction or a painful or sore muscle. And this idea that we, um, we can live in such a world is really just a fantasy. Um, vaccines are real medicine. Uh, they, they really do work, but they really do require a needle in most cases. Uh, in some injection sites, soreness, sometimes a fever. Uh, we have to accept this as, um, as the, the, the cost in protecting and preventing things that um, fortunately we don't see every day. Other questions? There are a number of places to go to get that kind of information. Um, one of the most uh, useful ones uh, is www.vaccines.gov. Um, experts from around the country have put together information um, uh, that's written for lay people, not doctors and nurses, um, that cover concerns parents have about vaccines. In Minnesota, our own um, uh, Deb Wexler and Diane Peterson have created a coalition that has put together information and resources for parents at www.immunize.org. Uh, the Immunization Action Coalition uh, located in St. Paul, Minnesota who uh, work very closely with the Minnesota Department of Health uh, in producing information. In fact, our Minnesota Department of Health puts together a monthly newsletter, Got Your Shots, filled with information for uh, parents and others for resources. The specific message of, uh, of, of where to get that information, I, I, pediatricians and family physicians and nurses can actually also give that information uh, and make uh, that accessible for parents so they're not just completely dependent on, on remembering some website links. In fact, at every vaccination, we do give a vaccine information statement regarding what this vaccine is for, what are the possible side effects, um, who shouldn't get this vaccine. We routinely do that with each vaccine, even if you're a parent two times over and you're, this is your eighth uh, dose of this vaccine in your family, you'll get that sheet. Um, I, so there's, there is a wealth of information out there, but it doesn't just take information. We used to think that's all that was needed, that we had to transfer some information over. But frankly, um, it, it takes a bit more. And I think uh, physicians, nurses, grandparents, neighbors need to understand this isn't just out there. We're talking about persuading. We're talking about advising. Um, we should speak with some real emotion about this and speak with some authority. We have the data. Uh, we have the science. Um, this is not just a choice a parent should be making. This is something we are strongly urging them to do. And I think that's critical. Uh, this is not just an option. Other questions? Any questions for Ms. Stevenson or, or, or Dr. Ellinger, too, please. I don't know who it would be for, but is there any um, demographic in, in Minnesota that um, is disproportionately, you know, um, susceptible to not getting vaccinated? Like, you know, immigrant populations, minorities, and if, if so, is there anything specifically that we could, you're doing or could do to address that? I, I've worked with a variety of people from all walks of life in my primary care practice here at Mayo Clinic, and I would argue this issue of complacency and hesitancy strikes at every socioeconomic level and at every walk of life. I would not want to be a patient or a parent in a foreign country um, speaking to a doctor who doesn't speak my language. One of the first things the Immunization Action Coalition did out of St. Paul was create vaccine information 
statements in more than 20 languages so that we can inform people in their own language. We've worked here at Mayo Clinic has, uh, has uh, given us resources to work closely with the Somali population here in Rochester, just as groups such as the University of Minnesota and Hennepin have worked with refugee groups uh, in St. Paul and um, Minneapolis uh, to help with that message. Uh, but it's not just uh, people from other countries. In fact, I would say it's all of us. Um, you, you know this. You know neighbors. You know brothers and sisters who have spoken up with these concerns. Frankly, I bet some of you have had some of these concerns. It's all of us. And we all have to get our bearings again, look back at where we've been with these diseases and look how we got to where we are now and never let go of that. Do we have any questions, uh, opponent? All right. Thank you very much for coming out here. We really appreciate it, all of us. And again, special thanks to Mrs. Stevenson and Dr. Ellinger.